I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for coming to our meeting tonight in Gal Sheens. And I'm saying here, Ladies and gentlemen, but this is a Tommy Sheridan meeting. So friends, comrades, brothers and sisters, welcome to our Hope Over Fear meeting here in Gallows Shields. I can't believe that I'm on after the proclaimers, but that's why I see the on Sunday, so I'm not, I'm not that bothered. My name is Graham McIver. I'm from Gallows Shields. I'm the National Secretary of Tommy's Party, Solidarity. Uh, I'm an activist in the Yes campaign here, and I'll be chairing tonight's meeting. Uh, I'll be doing a brief introduction and then Tommy will be speaking and we were just deciding there how long he's going to be speaking for. So, he sees about an hour, two hours, three hours, I don't, I, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep nudging him along because what we want to do at the end is have uh, some time for questions and answers and what we'll do is we'll have roving microphones that will be going out into the audience. So, what I'd ask you is uh, when the microphone comes to you, you just hold it up Next your mouth. Don't do that like what I'm doing. Because you, you, you can't hear, hear a lot of it. Uh, tonight's meeting in Gala Shields is one of... There's no other word but incredible for it. I think tonight is the 76th or 77th public meeting that Tommy Sheridan has done on independence in the last few months. He's spoken to over 14,000 people in these meetings. And that comes in the back, incidentally of about two years of doing bedroom tax meetings. Uh, probably well over a hundred of them as well. So uh, Tommy spoke to an incredible amount of people during this whole over here too. And we're delighted that we've got so many people in Gala Shields to come and hear a kind of radical vision, a socialist vision of an independent Scotland. And the vast majority of these meetings haven't been organised by people in political parties. The vast majority of them have been organised by people getting in touch with Tommy. Lorry drivers and single parents and pensioners. Just phoning up Tommy, are you available? I'll book a hall in my town. They get some leaf what's done. They do a, a table on a Saturday in the shopping precinct. And that's what's built these kind of meetings. And you know, it's indicative of a new type of politics that's emerging in Scotland. Throughout this uh, campaign, it's emerging from the yes side. It's a totally different type of politics. It's born away that kind of the old cobwebs of that it's a party organises thing and it's top down and all that. All of the Yes campaigns and the borders, there's over a dozen Yes campaigns, genuinely active and every time eh, in the borders, organising events, public events, music events, art events, you know, they're taking place all the time. And it demonstrates there's a tremendous appetite for information about this referendum and what we hear all the time is we don't hear enough, we don't get enough information about the referendum. So we hope that tonight, whether you're yes eh, or no or undecided, that, that you leave this meeting having felt it was worthwhile, that you've learned more. And if you are no, we hope we'll move you towards a yes. If you are yes already but you haven't been out campaigning, we hope that you'll get involved eh, in helping the campaign. This is the only speaking uh, engagement that Tommy's got on the borders as part of this tour, but he's, he's literally been all over the country. Uh, but he's not the only politician to have visited us on the borders recently. We've been quite lucky, you know. We had just the other week Alistair Darwin, remember him? <laughs> Alistair Darwin, the Better Together campaign, came and opened up a shop there, just up, up, up the high street there. Uh, and I have to say, for those of us in the you know, campaign for a yes vote, we're kind of thinking two ways about this. On the one hand, it's no good to see better together with a shopping gala. But on the other hand, it was really interesting to see what a no campaigner looks like. Because we're not we seen any. <laughs> have we seen any no campaigners uh, in, in gala? She was hardly any at all. Or I should clarify that. We haven't seen any who are not paid politicians or who are not paid by the no campaign. So, so Alistair came and then, they, they had balloons outside the shop, they had some balloons in the shop, but they had the balloons outside the shop, and Alistair, he got his photos taken, and the, the papers interviewed him, and all that, and uh, you know, he said, that if we vote for independence, there's a big risk, particularly in the borders, he said. Particularly here, we risk eight billion, that's eight billion pounds worth of cross-border trade and a quarter of a million jobs 
if we vote for yes. Huh? You know, in the borders, in the borders, well, across the whole of the country, but he said in the borders it's particularly important. And I thought, well, in terms of losing billions of pounds and hundreds of thousands of jobs, there's no debate a qualified than Alistair Darwin to tell us that, is it? I mean, he wrote the script. He wrote the script. He was Chancellor in 2007 when the economy went into meltdown, when we had to spend hundreds of billions bailing out the banks, the banks that he and his new Labour mates had helped deregulate. So, so Alistair, we know that he's an expert in these kind of things. But it wasn't just him. It wasn't just him who came to see us. George Osborne was in the borders, but you might not know about this. Because the George Osborne tickets were the available on event, right? You didn't have a social media campaign telling you to come to the George Osborne meeting. There wasn't a press release in the border telegraph. You didn't have me phoning you up or texting you or emailing you, begging you to come to the George Osborne meeting. It kind of sneaked in to a meeting in St. Boswell's. I don't know if you got the bus or whatever, you know, the down in St. Boswell's. But, but George arrived as well. So there's George. We're a hand-picked audience of business people. You know, and again, gets interviewed, and he said that for the borders and for Scotland, a yes vote would be economically catastrophic. <laughs> now, there's another guy that knows about economic catastrophe, George Osborne. This is a guy who's been a chancellor that's overseen the biggest rise in the gap between in wealth and inequality. Biggest rise in child poverty in food banks, food banks in 2014. You know, this is a guy that's overseen deregulation in employment, that's seen the introduction of zero hour contracts, that's seen, you know, workers in temporary jobs, temporary conditions, they don't go from one week to the next how much they're going to get paid. The gap between rich and poor in this country has never been wider than it is the now. And the interesting thing, that poverty is no longer just the preserve, if you like, of the unemployed and those in benefits. Because at the beginning of the year, the Low Pay Commission, they published uh, findings in a report entitled Working for Poverty. And it highlights that for the first time in the United Kingdom, the majority of people who are poor, who are considered poor, are actually working. They're not unemployed, they're not on benefits, they're actually working. And the Archbishop of York said in the introduction, the nature of poverty in Britain is changing. The idea of making work pay increasingly sounds like an empty slogan to the millions of people who are hard pressed, hard working, often in two or three jobs struggling to make ends meet, struggling to make a living. And here in the borders, we have some of the highest levels of low pay of anywhere in the United Kingdom. This is the tops of the table and low pay, and not just in low, in low pay, as I say, about workers' rights, workers' uh, contracts. In April 2014, earlier this year, a House of Commons Select Committee published a report about unscrupulous employers exploiting workers through zero-hour contracts, the scandal of zero-hour contracts. The Westminster Parliament Scottish Affair Committee noted that there had been an alarming increase in the use of casual labour who in some cases are not paid a legal minimum wage. The committee found that around one-fifth of all workers in zero-hour contracts are paid less than the permanent equivalents for doing the same job, whilst many receive less than the national minimum wage, and a number turned up for work only to be told their services are not required. Using figures for the STUC, the Scottish Trade Unions Congress, the Secretary Graham Smith said that in Scotland there are 85,000 people on zero hour contracts. And then you have other industries like in the NHS and care work. I used to work in care work here in Gala Shields. The problem isn't the zero hour contracts, the problem is working 70 hours, 80 hours, in excess of 80 hours a week. And here in the borders we have one of the largest and growing populations of, of elderly people. That's going to get worse as, uh, as time goes on. And you think now, the services that are providing care to the elderly are under huge amounts of pressure. And we're told that this coalition government, if they're returned, they've still got another £60 billion worth of austerity cuts to come. 
Now that isn't turning the lights off when you leave the office. That's no saving on photocopying or paper clips. That's frontline services to the most vulnerable in our society. And it brings me to my point, really, at last, I hear you all cry here, about the case put forward by Alistair and George or Gideon or whatever we want to call them. And that is that we're better together. Better together. That's the name of their campaign. Although they change it all the time, there was no thanks, but it was better together. And you know, I was thinking, what a distortion of reality that is. What a scandal. What a sick joke. Any country in 2014, with the wealth that exists in our society, with the resources that we have in front of us, that relies on food banks, with its pensioners having to make decisions about whether they heat their house or they eat, where increasing numbers of children are uh, brought up in, in poverty, that's not there together, that's broken. It's broken. George Osborne came here to talk about the economic consequences of what independence could bring. And I have to say, what does George Osborne know about economic consequences or anything? He's the 23rd great-grandson of Henry III. His father has a baronet. He's a part of the oldest Anglo-Irish aristocracy. He's a multi-millionaire and a cabinet of millionaires. What does George Osborne know when he talks about the economic consequences that independence can bring? The guy's not got a clue. Westminster's just under 400 miles from Gallows Hills. It'd be as well been a million miles from Gallows Hills for what George Osborne knows about the economic consequences that we face. What does he know about making your money last to the end of the week on your electric meters in the red? What does he know about if you're having to pay the bedroom tax, or as I say, if you're an elderly person making decisions about what you're going to spend your money on? What does he know what it's like to have your benefit cut or sanction, and literally have no money, literally have no money, and the number of people on benefits who can get in sanction is getting increased all the time. What does he know about a zero hour contract? What does he know about going for a job and not knowing from one neat week to the next what your pay is going to be? What does he know about going to the bank, trying to get a mortgage, or trying to even get a bank loan, and you can't tell the bank what your income is, you can't project your income? because you don't know what it's going to be. The vast majority of people in Scotland didn't vote for George Osborne. That's the fact. We didn't vote for tax cuts for the rich or austerity policies that are now inflicted on us. We didn't vote for a hundred families in the borders. One hundred families in the Scottish borders, not in places where me and Tommy have worked before in Shettleston, in Glasgow or Easter House or Muir House, not in these inner city deprived areas where some people might expect that there's an increase in poverty or that people have to rely on handouts. This is in the Scottish borders. 100 families have to go to food banks in order to feed themselves and their kids. And Alistair Darwin came and spoke about the threat to jobs. Well, it was Alistair Darwin's government that was in charge when I, along with about a thousand other people, lost their jobs at biosystems, highly skilled electronics jobs. And at that time there was an electronics industry in the borders that employed thousands of people. It's virtually gone. There's very little left of it. As, as we all know, textiles, this used to be one of the centres, a world leader in producing and manufacturing textiles. Some of the most important and biggest brand names in the world were based in the borders. They've gone. Manufacturing jobs in the borders have gone. The same as elsewhere. But in the borders, there's virtually no manufacturing. So we're left with service industries. We're left with getting jobs when you phone up the supermarket and they tell you, you can start on Monday and you're on eight hours a week. But if you stick in, you can get up to 12 hours a week. And if you stick in again, you can be in 16 hours a week. How, how can you plan and budget? How can you plan and budget for your family? And you've got that. So those high skilled jobs that we once have have been replaced by those uncertainties. And the poverty, the uncertainty, the loss of skilled jobs did not come with independence. This is the thing. It wasn't independence that lost us those jobs. It wasn't independence that brought food bags. It was dependence. Dependence on a rotten, corrupt, 
Westminster system of government that's been proved it's not fit for purpose. <laughs> and how dare they come here and preach to us about the dangers of independence, the dangers of what, the dangers of us taking control of our own destiny, us making the decisions that matter, us being in charge of the economic levers of power, us being the ones that say there is an alternative, there is an alternative to this austerity uh, project that all the main parties in Westminster are united in, by the way. Doesn't it matter where you vote for Labour or Liberal or Tories, come the next general election, it'll be more austerity. Well, we say, we don't want that. We want to make a break from that. We want to show that you can be different. You can be independent. You can make different choices, different decisions that affect it the way that we, that we lie. The risk to our future does not come from yes. The risk to our future comes from a no vote in September 18th. <laughs> I don't believe my remarks at that, thank God, I hear you say it, but and introduce somebody who, who will lay out, who will mark out in much greater detail what kind of alternative that we could have. And brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a man who spent his entire political life fighting for a different type of society, a fairer type of society, a socialist type of society. A man who, when he was in the parliament, took half his wages, took half of his wages so that he earned the same as a skilled worker and donated the rest of the money back to the socialist movement in Scotland. A man who went to prison opposing the poll tax. You will remember, those of us who are old enough to remember the poll tax, Tommy ripping up the war and, and, and defying sheriff officers. He defied them then, and then when he was in the parliament, he defied them again because he introduced a bill to get rid of pendants and warrant sales where working class people had their furniture dragged out in the street and sold. Tommy got rid of that. It just shows what you can do when you get people like Tommy Sheridan into a parliament. Friends, comrades, brothers and sisters, Tommy Sheridan. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, brothers and sisters. I have to say that uh, tenor was well worth it. It was a brilliant introduction, Gail. Uh, it's in the post. I've got to say, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure to come to Gala Shields for two reasons. Number one, the drive here was breathtaking. I've got to say, yeah, I've, I've done this in my 78th meeting and I've driven all over Scotland because the transport links are quite poor and they don't get you home in time, so the only way you can get home from a meeting in a lot of the places is to drive. And I thought the drive down here was absolutely breathtaking, absolutely beautiful, and look at the turn up. Tremendous. Thanks to each and every one of you for making the effort to come along. But the second reason that I'm really, really pleased that I've came to Gala Shields is because I parked in the wee Tesco uh, underground car park there, uh, just down the hill, uh, and when I was walking over, I got accosted by three young women who all wanted to get selfies taken. You know what it's like, these selfies and all that. Um, I told them, look, I'm in a hurry, you'll need to do this in the next hour, because um, that's all I like. Uh, seriously, when the, when the wife gets me home, I think one of them left some makeup on my shoulder, so I'm in for a good when I get in the night, that's for sure. But there you go, I'll remember Gala Shields, I'll probably have the bruises to prove that I was here. Um, I also have to say, it's quite unique, very unique actually, because of the 78 meetings I've managed to do across Scotland, it's dead, dead interesting to actually know the guy who's organising it. Normally I turn up at these meetings and say, hiya, all right, are you the guy that contacted me on Facebook or Twitter or phone or text or whatever, because you just don't know people. That's the nature of this grassroots campaign. The nature of this grassroots campaign is there are tens of thousands of yes campaigners on the ground all across Scotland, all pulling in one direction, Many of us, by the way, have got different visions of how we'd like to see an independent Scotland develop. What we want an independent Scotland to look like. But the one thing that unites us all is we all want an independent Scotland. And that tent, that yes tent, 
is huge. This is the biggest grassroots campaign Scotland has ever seen. No doubt about it. I was involved, I had the pleasure to be involved in the last big grassroots campaign that Scotland witnessed. That was the poll tax campaign. That was when ordinary working class folk got up off their knees and fought against Thatcher's poll tax. Thought, fought against it. I am lady. And by the way, just to take a wee bit of sucker, a wee bit of encouragement from those who tell us we're never going to win. We get told that at the beginning in the poll tax campaign as well. I remember getting told on it. Hey, oh, Tommy, come on, son. You're up against the Iron Lady. You can't even beat her. She beat the miners. She beat the printers. She beat the nurses. For God's sake, she even took on Galtieri. She beat him as well. Of course, her blood was never threatened. It was always what class boys that were sent out to do the hard work. But there you go. She got the credit for it. You can't even beat. The Iron Lady, they said at the beginning of the anti poll tax campaign. Brothers and sisters, not only did we beat the poll tax, but we melted down the Iron Lady and shipped her off to the political knackers yard where she belonged. That's the thing in relation to the poll tax. And the truth is, the truth is we're going to take some encouragement from that experience into the Yes campaign here and now because you know what see when you get people like Tony Abbott he's the latest one you might know, know him you might think he's one of the brothers of Abbott and Costello yeah. uh, no he's actually the Prime Minister of Australia and he's been bumping his gums he's been telling us that uh, only those that are enemies of freedom would want independence there you go, but enemies of freedom for one of freedom. There you go. <laughs> uh, George Orwellian or what? We have Tony Abbott waving in the debate at the weekend there, the Australian Premier. We shouldn't be surprised because before him we had the Chinese Premier. Now, I can't remember his name. And it's not wrong because he can't remember mine either. So it's not a problem. I don't know much about China. And to be honest, I don't think he knows much about Scotland. But he was pumping his gums as well. It was in China's interest, apparently, for a strong, united kingdom. And then we have Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's come out as well, you know. The president in waiting, we're told. And she's been saying, oh no, it's in America's interest for Britain to stay united. Barack Obama. Now a year ago, Barack said he wasn't going to get involved in the debate. But no, last month he came out and said, it's America's interest for a strong, united kingdom. Now I've got to say to you folks, a couple of things about this. Number one, Hillary and Barack, I have to say, because they said this, they said this at the end of June, and I thought to myself, this is going to be interesting on the 4th of July. <laughs> this is going to be interesting because they won't be celebrating Independence Day in America. They'll be announcing that they're coming back under the tutelage of Britain because it's very, very good, you know. It's very, very worthwhile. I thought to myself, we're getting a president and a future president of America telling us to stay with Britain. Surely it makes sense for them to come back under the fold. <laughs> and of course they didn't. Brothers and sisters, as far as Barack and Hillary are concerned, I've got one message for them. If independence was good enough for America, it's good enough for Scotland as well. That's the reality. But it's, no, it's not just been them, is it? We've also had the, the multi billionaire brigade. There was a big letter published, I don't know if you've seen it last week, 200 of the, the worthies and the celebrities, most of them sirs and lords and OBEs and CBEs, all telling us that it was better together, we'll all to stay together. And then we had the clincher, the clincher by the way, I mean come on, most of you will follow this man, Simon Curl. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Curl has come out now for a no vote. You know, I'm not going to slag him, I used to wear my cruisers away up there as well. <laughs> he was a style set, I was put out about that. 
And he's come out and told us that we want to stay together. Brothers and sisters, the reason I mention all of that is because I want you to look at the bigger picture. Apparently there's an old gardener's adage that sometimes in order to appreciate your garden, you have to just stand back and look at the roses. I think we're so involved in this campaign that we're not actually taken out of all of this as much as we should. You see, the reason the President of the United States of America has broken his promise of a year ago not to get involved in this campaign, the reason Hillary Clinton has given us her opinion, the reason the Chinese Premier has got involved, the reason the Australian Prime Minister has got involved, the reason the 200 celebrities, serves and loves, lords and what's their names, have signed their letters and sent them to the press. The reason they're all telling us that they want us to vote no is because they know they're losing the debate. That's what's happening here, brothers and sisters. It is with one month to go to this referendum, squeaky bum time for the British establishment. That's the reality. That's why. That's why they get involved and roping in all of these functionaries and multi-millionaires, all of these individuals who they think will influence the vote in a month's time. See if they thought they were winning this hands down and you wouldn't hear from them. But they know that they're losing this. The truth of the matter is, if you look at all of the opinion polls, you look at them consistently over this last six months, what they show clearly now is it's neck and neck. I tell you what, brothers and sisters, here is a very, very simple fact. If everyone who is already a yes voter convinces one more person, one more person to come off the fence and become a yes voter, we will be celebrating our independence on the 19th of September. That's how close it is. That's how close it is. We have meetings like this, brothers and sisters, that are welcome to those who are already yes, to those who are undecided, and to those who may, at this stage, be no voters. For those of you that are yes voters, <coughs> it is important you come to meetings like this, even though you've made up your mind. I don't want you to leave as a yes voter. I want you to leave two feet taller as a yes ambassador, a yes crusader, a yes campaigner. I want you to come to this meeting and hopefully pick up wee snippets of information, wee bits of advice, statistics that will give you the confidence to go back into your household back into your workplace, back into your community and argue the case for yes. Those of you that are undecided, I hope you've came tonight with an open mind and I hope you'll listen to what I've got to say and what others have got to say and that you'll leave here decided that you're going to join the ranks of those who are for hope and not going to be deflected by fear. For those of you that are no voters, well, I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll give us a second chance. I hope at the very, very least, you'll think again. Brothers and sisters, before we explain in detail what this referendum is all about, let's clarify so there is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind what this referendum is not about. You see, as I travel across Scotland, I come across political activists from very many political parties. And I have to say, I take my hat off to the Scottish National Party. For many, many years, the SNP have kept the question of independence. Others have done the same, but the SNP more consistently than anybody. have kept the question of independence on the political agenda. Well done to them. Well done to them. Can I say to you on the 18th of September, brothers and sisters, the referendum 
It's got nothing to do with the SNP. It's got nothing to do with Alec Salmon. Nothing to do with whether you like, love, or loathe Alec Salmon. See, when you go into the wee polling booth, you're going to get a polling paper. Guess what? There's no political party on that ballot paper. The only thing on that ballot paper is yes and no. Brothers and sisters, this vote in one month's time is not about politicians. It's not about political parties. This vote in a month's time is much more important than any one single politician, any one single political party. This vote in a month's time it's about the future of your children and your grandchildren. It's about the future of your country. That's what this vote is all about. But I need to keep this up there now. Don't allow them. Don't allow the bitter together crew to stop this debate. Don't allow them to have you believe this is a popularity contest about whether you support SNP or support Alex Salmon. Got nothing to do with them. The reason they're going down that strategy is they hope to play particularly to the old, loyal, Labour supporting constituency, particularly in the West Central Bell of Scotland. They hope to raise the idea, forget all of the real reasons to vote independence, to vote yes, forget that. Concentrate on, oh, if you vote yes, you know you're supporting the SNP, oh, you can't do that. That would be disloyal to the Labour Party. Brothers and sisters, I've got to say to traditional Labour Party supporters, I make a direct appeal to you. You have not abandoned the Labour Party the Labour Party has abandoned you. That's the reality. That's the reality. This referendum offers the opportunity for those traditional Labour supporters, for socialists, for Democrats, for anybody who's left of centre in the political spectrum. This independence referendum offers you the opportunity to deliver here in Scotland everything we've always fought for, everything we've always dreamed for. That's the reality. Tying ourselves to Westminster is tying ourselves to more poverty, more inequality, more social division. We can get off the bus. We can get off the bus that's leading to more privatisation, that's leading to more cuts in public services, that's leading to more low pay, that's leading to more unemployment. We can get off the bus and build a new and a better Scotland. Brothers and sisters, this referendum isn't about political parties or politicians. This referendum is about freedom. Freedom. Some people may think Tommy's been touching the sherries again. He's maybe <laughs> had a wee tipple before he came in. Is he, is he no over-egging that pudding? Where's the Claymore? Where's the Kill? Where's the Braveheart DVD? Has he been listening to the soundtrack all the way down here from Glasgow? <laughs> We're not exactly in prison. We're not exactly in cages. We're not exactly in shackles. We're not exactly in handcuffs. And I know a thing or two about being in handcuffs. <laughs> I have to say, I have to quickly add, in case there's any gutter journalists here, none of it for kinky reasons, by the way. <laughs> I'll tell you what. We are in handcuffs. We are in political handcuffs. I'll tell you why. Since 1951, this wee country, Scotland, has rejected the political creed of greed. 
This wee country, Scotland, has rejected the political manifesto that dictates the way to motivate the working class is pay them less and get them to work longer, but the way to motivate the ruling class is to cut their taxes and give them bigger bonuses. This wee country, Scotland, has rejected the political agenda that dictates that public services are for sale to the highest bidder, to the city spivs in the city of London, to make them richer and to make everyone else poorer. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we, we, since 1951, have rejected that political agenda because that's the agenda of the Conservative Party. And since 1951, this wee country has rejected every single Conservative manifesto in every single election since 1951. But here's the political handcuffs. Since 1951, we've rejected it. But we've had to endure 35 years of Tory governments that we never voted for. 35 years of people like Thatcher and Major and Cameron. Thatcher destroying communities, destroying industries, raining unemployment and poverty, bringing in low pay and social division. Communities that I see across Scotland, they used to be thriving. Didn't they know what unemployment was? Didn't they know what illegal drugs were? But they know now. They know now because they've been ripped apart by them. Because it's the way that many people try to blot out the reality of their sorry lives. And for others, it's the only employment they can get in the black market selling drugs. When they used to be engineers, they used to be miners, they used to be shipyard workers. These people, these, and I apologise if there are any children in the hall tonight, these bastards who couldn't give a damn about Scotland. In fact, think about it. Think about what Thatcher did. Because we rejected her creed, what did she do? She deliberately punished Scotland. She deliberately punished us. She brought de-industrialization. She was determined to make us pay because we didn't support her. Brothers and sisters, we have the new Thatcher in the shape of David Cameron. That wee millionaire tough who wouldn't know unemployment if it fell in the seat. Who wouldn't know a council house if he walked into one. We have got an Oxfam report here from June telling us that the rate of inequality that has developed in Britain as a result of these condemned cuts amounts to, quote, speeded up Thatcherism. Speeded up Thatcherism. Here's the worry. That report makes the point that so far, across the UK, only 40% of the cuts that have been announced in the welfare and public services budgets have been implemented. There's still 60% to come. 2014-2015 is going to see a massive slashing in public services and public service jobs. And by the way, Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest unemployment rate in the world. Scotland has the highest uncertainties, uncertainties for Scotland to vote for independence. Well, here's a wee certainty for them. Here's the dossier that was exposed by the Daily Record at the weekend. And by the way, very surprising the Daily Record exposed it. It's usually the Daily Pravda as far as the no campaign is concerned, sadly. Sadly. However, we Danny Alexander, the ginger rodent, was sitting there in the back of his car. And he had that dossier on his knee, 
and he had it open, and it allowed some photographs to get taken, and people read the pages. And what did the pages reveal? That because of the 83,000 million pounds, 83 billion pounds cuts to welfare and public services, between now and 2015, there's going to be another 490,000 job losses in the public services. 490,000, almost half a million more job losses. We Douglas is rattling on about uncertainties. Well, there's a certainty for you, isn't it? You want certainties? There's a certainty. And no hope is a green light for more job losses, for more carnage, yep. as far as the public services are concerned. And by the way, that's not all. That wee dossier goes on to say, alongside the 490,000 job losses, they will preserve other jobs through, and I just want to quote, encouraging pay restraint and reducing hours. There you go. It's not just 490,000 job losses in the public services. You're going to get pay cuts and you're going to get less hours. What does that amount to, brothers and sisters? What does that amount to? I'll tell you what that amounts to. That amounts to more of what was revealed in this report here by Save the Children. First year, first year of the condemned government. The condemned government, by the way, as Graham pointed out, 29 members of your cabinet. 29 members of the cabinet. 23 of them personal millionaires. How representative is that of society? Do you know that that represents 78% of the cabinet? Millionaires. Do you know how many millionaires there is as a percentage in society as a whole? Not 0.7%. 78% of the cabinet millionaires representing not 0.7% of society millionaires. It's the most singly unrepresentative cabinet in British history. And these millionaires, they pontificate, as they did last April, about the way working class people should live their lives. You see, if you live in a council house, or you live in a housing association house, and you're low paid, you have to prove that you're low paid. You have to prove that you're poor in order to qualify for housing benefit. The overwhelming majority of recipients of housing benefit now are workers. Workers whose wages are too low, they can't afford the rent. What did that bunch of political cretins do around the wee table last April? They sat there and said, yeah, you know, we need to get some cuts here, you know. We're all in it together. <laughs> Let's cut the housing benefit budget by 500 million by cutting the housing benefit of disabled families and workers with children. If these working class people think they can get away with their kids having separate bedrooms We'll give them another thing to think about. We'll force them to share bedrooms or else we'll cut the housing benefit. Think about that. Think about that piece, crass, cruel piece of political engineering. Ah, listen to the education minister six months ago talking about working class kids have poor educational attainments largely because they don't have the right environment in their house. Many of them don't have their own bedrooms to encourage them to study properly. And on the other hand, we'll get Ian Duncan Smith introducing policies to make sure they don't have their own bedrooms. That's the type of policies these people come out with. And in the same day, the same day, because remember, we're all in it together. <laughs> they decided to introduce a tax cut. A tax cut that wasn't going to save 500 million. It was going to cost you, the Exchequer, 1,300 million pounds in lost revenue. They decided on the same day they introduced the bedroom tax to cut the tax on those 
on incomes of £150,000 a year and more, from 50 pence in the pound to 45 pence in the pound. 13,000 millionaires in Britain today pay £100,000 a year less in tax than they did last year. And we're all in it together. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that's why policies like that is why Save the Children produced a report saying in the first year, the first year of this condemned government, 900,000 more people, 900,000, oh, almost 1 million more people are now officially poor, driven into poverty by the combination of welfare and public service cuts. Workers, not just in the public sector, but in the private sector, who haven't had a wage increase in real terms now for 16 years. The longest period since 1918 without an increase in real terms wages for workers in Britain. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the amount of workers suffering real pay cuts because the wages on the keeping line with inflation. I want you to think of the one in four kids in poverty here in Scotland and across the UK born to fail, born into poverty. I want you to think of the fact that across the 28 European Union countries we have got the poorest pensions and the poorest pensioners in the whole of the European Union. What's even in Greece? I want you to think of the fact that we've got the lowest pay rates in the whole of the European Union. I want you to think of the fact that we've got the highest housing costs in the whole of the European Union. I want you to think of the fact that we've got the highest fuel costs in the whole of the European Union. I want you to think of the fact that we've got the highest transport costs in the whole of the European Union. I want you to think of the fact that we've got one million families in Britain today. One million! 4,000 wins a day in Glasgow relying on food banks for survival. I want you to think of the 1 million, the 90,000 in Scotland, the 1 million across the UK, predominantly young workers who are living in zero hour contracts, getting paid less than the legal minimum wage, don't know from day one to day two whether they've got a job. I want you to think of all of that and then I want you to think of the no campaign slogan UK OK Well it's not OK for me brothers and sisters It's not good enough It's not good enough I want you to say the next no campaigner you meet if you ever meet one <laughs> I want you to look them in the eye and tell them about the poverty, the inequality, the fact that there's a report out today. Some of you may have seen it. 1998. 1998. The ratio of difference between the bosses pay of the top 100 companies in Britain and the workers that they employed. The ratio was 47 to 1. The bosses earned 47 times more the workers who made all the wealth for them. That's a disgrace. You know what the ratio is today? 143 to 1. 143 to 1. It's grotesque. I want you, the next time you see a no campaigner, I want you to say to them, better together? Well, why are we not better today? Why are we not better today if we're better together? That's what I have to ask them. We've got the freedom in our hands, brothers and sisters. The freedom in our hands to declare 
For our kids and our grandkids, you had one reason. One reason to vote yes to the 18th of September. You can see it in your wings. I'm voting yes, son. I'm voting yes, Ed. Because I don't want you ever to suffer a Tory government ever again. That's why I guess vote the other. That's what we deliver. You've got the freedom, brothers and sisters, to save something. To save something that should mean a lot to each and every one as I particularly want to address here. Particularly the elderly community, the senior citizens who rely on this service often a lot more than everyone else. We've already had the declaration from the DWP, the Department of Water Pensions, that there is no threat to pensions. There is no threat whatsoever to pensions. What there is, is there's a guarantee that pensions will increase higher in an independent Scotland than they would if we stay in the UK. That's the guarantee. But here's the other, here's the other service, the National Health Service. Brothers and sisters, please believe this. Go and do your own research. Go and listen to Professor Alison Pollock, Professor of Health Economics. Go and listen to Dr. Philippa Whiteford, cancer consultant with over 30 years experience in the health service. Go and listen to what they have said about the Health and Social Care Act passed in the Westminster Parliament, applying to England in 2012. 455 pages. First two pages, abolish. The legal commitment has existed for 60 years for the Secretary of State for Health in England to provide free and universal health care to the citizens of England. Gone. Doesn't exist any longer. What they've now done is they've started to create a new private market for the provision of health care in England. They've invited 60 private companies to bid to provide health care. Royal Bank of Scotland, Price Waterhouse Coopers, Virgin Money, Blue Circle Cement. Would they know about health care? Bugger all. <laughs> Would they know about making money? Plenty. <laughs> They've been invited. Cancer care. Children's health. They've been invited to bid for the provision of those services. Brothers and sisters, they want fear tactics. They call them no campaign project fear. Here's a real fear. Please get this out there. See if you want to save the National Health Service. You better vote yes. You better vote yes because what do these people, what do these professionals say? Within five years of a no vote in Scotland, the Health Service will be unrecognisable. Within ten years, it will be privatised. Privatised. You've got it within your grasp to stop it. We now have a commitment, by the way, it should have been out earlier, in my opinion, but we've got a month to go. We now have a commitment not just to keep the private sector out of our public health service, we now have a commitment that it will be enshrined in a written constitution. <laughs> still with their education services as they are today. I want a lot of improvement. Far too many working class kids still can't afford to go to university because they can't afford the debt they get into. I think in an independent Scotland we've got to invest in our working class kids and make sure they get the same opportunities as the wealthier families and that means in an independent Scotland not only do we know our tuition fees up front, but we have living grants for students as well, so that we can study in university. You know, in England, they have up front tuition fees. £9,000 a student a year. £9,000. Four year degree, 36 thousands of pounds. Brothers and sisters, 
we will not be able to stop upfront tuition fees in Scotland if we vote no. Our free education will be no more. Some people in the Better Together campaign say, oh, come on, there will be a minute here. Health and education are already devolved. Why would voting no threaten these services? I'll tell you why. Because if we vote no, we are going to send a signal to Mr. Cameron. We are going to send a signal to the Tories. We're going to send a signal, perhaps even, to that Egypt Farage who's waiting on the sidelines to form part of a new right-wing coalition government next May. And the signal will be absolutely clear. The jocks have they got any bottle. That's the signal. The jocks can sing to their heart's content when they're playing football or rugby. They can give up Flower of Scotland and they can give up Laldi. But when it comes to controlling the destiny of our own country, they don't have the courage. We have smelled the blood. We are coming after your public services. Burn that formula. Do you think they in Westminster, after we vote no, are going to say, ah, no problem. Here's enough money to keep your health service public. Here's enough money to keep your education free. If you believe in that, you believe in fairies. That's the reality, brothers and sisters. I know folks. A no vote signals the privatisation of our health service and it signals the loss of our free education. I'll tell you what else we've got the freedom for, but I'll tell you what else we've got the freedom for. This rocks my boat, maybe more than others, I don't know. Maybe it's to do with the amount of times I've been arrested doing it fast lane. <laughs> maybe. But what a freedom we've got in our hands here. What a freedom. I don't know about you folks. But I get absolutely sick to the back teeth by all of the various campaigns. Remember, Make Poverty History, we all marched in Edinburgh. Live Aid, Band Aid, UNICEF Appeals. What happens? Working class folk all across the country dig into their pockets to try and stop starving wains from dying of malnutrition. That's what happens. Brothers and sisters, I want to raise this question with you here tonight. Why, or oh why is it that there's never enough money, apparently, to feed malnourished wings? There's never enough money to cure cholera and dysentery and diarrhea. But there's always enough money for bombs and missiles and wars across the world. Why is that? Why? for us here in Scotland to strike a blow, not just for freedom, but to strike a blow for world peace as well. Because what we're going to do on the 18th of September, what we've got the freedom to do on the 18th of September is to consign nuclear weapons in Britain into the dustbin where they belong. That's what we can do right now. Information Centre report two weeks ago. They evaluated what we could do instead of rearming, trying what we could do with the money. They said we could afford to employ another 2,900 teachers in Scotland, 3,500 nurses in Scotland, 100 new community hospitals, 20,000 new council houses. Brothers and sisters, we've got the freedom here. We've got the freedom, I ask you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer more nuclear bombs? Or do you prefer to spend your tax money on schools and hospitals and doctors and nurses? That's what's important. That's what's expected of us. And just, just in case there's any room for doubt here, I don't want nuclear weapons 
to be shifted to Portsmouth. Minister of Defence have already done a feasibility study. They concluded that the potential collateral damage would be too great. So keep them in the cloud. <laughs> what does that mean then? Eh? We'd expect them, that's what that means. I don't want nuclear weapons to be moved to the Clyde. I saw the postman. I want nuclear weapons to be decommissioned completely. But by the way, in the interim period while we're waiting for them to be decommissioned, we need to move them somewhere. And I've got this idea as a big, big river. <laughs> and it's got a huge big hoose. <laughs> To be decommissioned, let's shift them right outside the Houses of Parliament. That's what we should do. That's what we should do. I wonder, I wonder how long it will take them to decommission. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I hope that in some of the arguments you've heard tonight, they have encouraged you to go and convince others. You see, we are told all the time, aren't we? We've been told for decades. We're no good enough. No big enough. We're no smart enough. We're no rich enough. There's one statistic which you have to take away for the night when people make that point. I had the opportunity, would you call it, of sharing a studio, makeshift studio in Edinburgh with Michael Buffon Patillo former defence minister, the Thatcher government. I preferred him when he was a defence minister than a pundit, I'm going to say. At least I knew where I was coming from. And he was sitting across from me and he's tarting trousers and uh, he had no pockets in them. <laughs> Why would he have pockets? He never puts his on in them for Christ's sake. <laughs> Parliament used to pay for everything, now it's the BBC. <laughs> one way or another, it's the public. <laughs> And I made a number of points about an independent Scotland being able to pay a living wage instead of a poverty minimum wage. I made a few points about how if everyone in Scotland had the legal entitlement to a living wage, everyone in Scotland would benefit from that. Because when workers are paid higher wages, they spend them. And when they spend them, they create demand for goods and services, particularly in the private sector and particularly in the small business sector. We would have a dynamic economy. We would have a win-win situation because we would save money in welfare because we wouldn't have to give workers and employment benefits because their wages were so damn low. But we would also encourage more economic demand, more economic activity, which would give dignity to workers and would also create more demand for goods and services. I said that we could have smaller class sizes in an independent Scotland so that all the wings get a decent chance at education. I said that we could have a massive council house building programme so we can address the twin evils. On the one hand, unemployment. On the other hand, housing shortage and overcrowding. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out, is it? Well, we've got unemployed people. We've got a demand for housing. Why don't we train them? to be the brickies, the joiners, the plumbers, the quantity surveyors, the glaziers, and put them to work so that we solve homelessness, we solve overcrowding, we solve the housing waiting list, and we give people a decent history of living. Wouldn't that be nice in an independent story? And the bull Michael, the bull Michael listened to me and he said, ah, oh, but Mr. Sheridan doesn't understand. Didn't understand in an independent Scotland, of course, they'll lose English subsidies. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is supposed to be an educated man, allegedly. English subsidies. Brothers and sisters, don't they know? The economic facts are there for anybody to read. Every single, every single year for the last. 33 years in a row. No one, two, three. This is their flash in the pan. 33 years in a row. 
this wee country, Scotland, has paid more into the Chancellor Exchequer's pot than we've got back from the Chancellor Exchequer's pot. That's an economic fact. That's an economic fact. Subsidies, my ass, is what we should be saying to them. The last five years alone, Business for Scotland have done the research. The last five years alone, if Scotland had got to keep the tax and revenue that we generated instead of sending it to Westminster, we would have an extra, an extra £8,500 million pounds to spend in Scotland. Eight and a half billion pounds. Brothers and sisters, Forget about cuts. We would be invested in public services, not cutting public services. That's the reality. That's what we've got. That's what we've got the potential we do. Brothers and sisters, as I said earlier, we all share different visions. My vision of an independent Scotland isn't the same as the leaders of the SNP. I don't actually want the Bank of England to have anything to do with an independent Scotland. I don't want to share Scotland. I want Scotland to have its own currency, organised and guided by an independent public owned Scottish Bank. That's what I want. I want a Scottish currency. I don't want... I don't want us automatically to walk into the European Union. I think the European Union, in my opinion, is a corrupt big business club that promotes the free market at the expense of workers' rights and public services. It's not got any interest in us as ordinary people. I want a referendum on whether or not an independent Scotland joins the European Union. I would much rather have bilateral trading agreements with European countries. Norway, Finland, North Atlantic Free Trade Agreements, let's do things which make sense for Scotland. Instead of being told by the European Union, oh no, I'm sorry, you can't uh, renationalise your railways because that would be anti-competitive. You can't invest in shipyards and subsidise your shipyards because that would be anti-competitive. Well, I'm sorry, independence should be independence. If we want to do those things, if we want to do those things, we should be allowed to do those things. I disagree with the idea that the SNP leadership have of a slimmed down monarchy as our head of state. I've got to say I disagree. I don't want to put any of them on a diet at all. <laughs> Slim fast or whatever other diet. I just don't agree that there should ever be anyone in power who has got power over my life who hasn't been elected. I just don't want them on elected in this case. European Union, Head of State, it's all damned irrelevant unless we get independence. Yes. Yes. Unless we get independence, it's irrelevant. Yes. Yes. And what you're doing on the 18th of September, you're not voting for a political party, as I said earlier, you're not voting for a manifesto, you're not voting for who runs your country, you're voting for the right to decide who runs your country. That's what you think of September. a destination. Once we go independence, we don't just sit and put our feet up. The hard work begins to transform our country. Brothers and sisters, independence isn't a destination. It's only the beginning of the journey. The beginning of the journey of transforming Scotland into a socially progressive, very fair, equal country that we can be proud of. Yes. A country that tackles poverty. A country that's ashamed of food banks. A country that decides there will never ever again be another pensioner dying prematurely of hypothermia because they can't afford to heat their house. That's what an independent Scotland offers us.
the potential to address. I'm going to finish, brothers and sisters. I spoke far too long and I apologise to my good friend Graham here. I'm going to finish by referring to this campaign as it's developed over this last seven, eight months. Some people have been involved in campaigns and they've been out most nights of the week, they've been at meetings, they've been leafleting. And many of you will share the same agony that I share. And that is that you're giving up your time for something you believe in and the opportunity cost of that is you don't see your Wayne as much, and you don't see your wife as much. And it hurts. It hurts that my Wayne says to me every morning, Daddy, why were you no in last night to kiss me good night in bed? It hurts. She's only nine. I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, the reason I'm doing this, and I know the reason many of you are involved in this campaign, is this independence referendum isn't it? <laughs> me as a 50 year old. Hi, I might see a few better years in an independent Scotland. But the reality is it's the nine year olds, the ten year olds that are going to realise the full potential of an independent Scotland. Yes. They're going to inherit a fairer country, a more equal country. They're going to inherit a country that's at peace with the world. They're going to inherit a country that doesn't just use its oil and gas reserves to pay the city spivs and the bankers massive bonuses. It uses its oil and gas reserves to make sure that they way relies on a food bank and their family doesn't have a decent house to live in. We're going to invest in renewable energy, wind, wave and solar power, so that we don't just be known as a country of peace, we become known as a country of clean energy technology as well. That's the legacy we're passing on to our children and that's why I give up my time and I'm sure you give up your time. That's the opportunity cost and I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it because I love that way as you love your way. Brothers and sisters, think about all those who tell us I'm not good enough, I'm not bad enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not smart enough. And think of the words of that wonderful song by Labby Sifri. Something inside so strong. Brothers and sisters, when they insist we are just not good enough. When we know better, just look them in the eyes and say, we're going to do it anyway. Thanks very much. That they may decide to move away from Scotland. Do you think that in an independent Scotland, there might be enough in the budget to give them a financial helping hand? <laughs> or God forbid the Conservatives get elected, are they going to then do a U-turn or will they be hell-bent on making sure we fail? Underness that the campaign has been too soft up till now. I think it would be nice and nice not want to offend too many people. And I've seen Alex Salmon quite frankly struggling with the question about the currency. I've seen that as a red tail myself. But why haven't they asked the question uh, to the, the, the No campaign, or the Better Together campaign. And in, in the, the event of a No vote, will you ensure that Scotland is democratically governed and for the No campaign, that would mean the abolition of the House of Lords and are you prepared to do that? Why haven't they attacked them on the, the whole aspect of democracy and what it would mean in the event of a No vote to expose the, the weakness and the stupidity of their arguments? Now, if no, I that when we get the SO, will that oil field be drilled? Uh, no, will we get the, the workers to all on their back, get our oil companies back in here again, just to make sure we have employment in the West? Now, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people here will think, well, we're we'll getting you know, employment in, in the borders, but I'm pretty sure that having employment over there, It'll mean that there'll be further employment like sub job made. So, will you actually get that from Scotland? Okay, one more. Is there anybody else? Uh, yes, I'm all for it. 
I think we can do it. But where you make borders, you cause divisions. And where there's divisions, there's strife. And there's enough strife, arguments over borders and religion to do me for the rest of my days. So, I don't want to see any more. I don't want to hear any angle slogans. I don't want to uh, fight with anybody. And if Scotland's going to be independent, fine. But I want to see it as a yes, we're better together independence. And I mean better together with everybody. Folks, thanks very much for the questions and I, I really do apologise. I hope there wasn't a lot of people sitting waiting to ask other questions and you have no time. I, I know we need to vacate the hall, um, but we can have another chat out in the street. I don't think it's raining, so um, <laughs> if, there, if there's burning questions that you need to ask and, and you think I can answer them, I'll certainly try and do that. Let me try and go through all of the, um, the questions that, that, that were raised. Um, first of all, in relation to these debates on the telly, I'm going to say, um, as a socialist who is concentrating on independence because I want a fairer, more equal Scotland, I want a radical Scotland, I don't want a Scotland that doesn't change. I want a Scotland that changes and becomes more equal and fairer. To watch Alistair Darling and, and Alex Salmond, who, you know, Alex Salmond's definitely more left of centre than, than the Alistair Darling, there's no doubt about that. But some of the policy areas that were on offer, it was a bit like two baldy men fighting on a comb, as far as I was concerned. There wasn't that, there wasn't that much difference. Um, and I've got to say that I don't think these TV debates have got anything like the influence that the media want us to believe that they've got. I read a report that the controlled, undecided group that went along to the STV debate apparently come out saying yes. They went undecided, come out saying yes. Yeah. How many of you heard of that? Right? Yeah. That should have been the story. <laughs> but it wasn't, it was it? It was all currency, Sam gets a do, and we couldn't answer the question. It was all waffle. It was all political souffle. The real story is, a group of real people went along at a debate as undecided voters and come out as yes voters. That should have been the big story. But you didn't, you didn't hear about it. Because the truth is, the media coverage of this referendum so far has been a damn disgrace. It's been absolutely biased. Absolutely biased against the yes campaign. That's why we've got to do everything we can to communicate what we've discussed here tonight with people via the social media. Will it be the Facebook? Will it be the Twitter? Will it be text? Give undiluted arguments. There's a camera here tonight. I don't know if that's recording the meeting and then I've got YouTube. Use YouTube. Here's a, here's a speech. There's a, there's a wee pamphlet that I hope some of you will dig into your pockets for. It's a pound that we get sold here. It's called Hope Over Fear. And this is a pamphlet that arose from a speech I gave in Kirkcaldy on the 23rd of January. And that was videoed and put up on YouTube, that speech. And by the way, it's far too long. Actually, we're coming in, it. I think it was only 37 minutes, which is quite short um, for me. But it's far too long. But it's at 140,000 views. 140,000. In a British white context, that's like 1.4 million people watching a speech. That shows you the power that exists, the desire that's there for some of the arguments. If you're looking for some of the facts, the figures, the statistics, get a hold of this wee pamphlet tonight. Use the social media undermine the mainstream media that is continually undermining the yes arguments in the yes campaign. So I don't think it matters in relation to these debates that much. Don't get me wrong. I think it helps, but only at the margins. In relation to people moving away from Scotland, um, you know, I hear all the time, every time I argue for fair taxation, well, you don't even need to argue for fair taxation. All you need to argue is that the rich pay their taxes. <laughs> that would be a start, wouldn't it? 
And then you hear this bleating about, oh, the rich will move away, they'll shift away. And I think, bro, we get them their passports and get them on their way. Get them on their way. I don't think we have to worry, folks, about people leaving Scotland, the independent Scotland. We will have people queuing up to come and live. to maybe taking the, the last point or the second last point at this stage, the brother made the point there about borders and he, he's worried that an independent Scotland is about erecting new borders. I've got to say to you brothers and sisters, first of all, in relation to the English working class, we have to make this absolutely plain. We're not abandoning the English working class, we're leading the English working class. <laughs> Because in an independent Scotland, when we invest more, not less, in our health service. In an independent Scotland, when we invest more, not less, in education for working class kids. In an independent Scotland, when we invest more, not less, in social housing. We will show in concrete terms that there is an economic alternative to the madness of the neo-liberal economic game that's the only game on town in Westminster. By the way, does not matter? Does not matter whether it's Labour that wins the next election? Ed Miliband, you wouldn't have him running a bloody bath, never mind running a country. <laughs> he's went public and said, oh yes, we will be tired. How many we pal Ed Balls? Talk balls. <laughs> be tied to the same cuts, the same austerity, but we'll do it gentler. <laughs> you know, you're going to get a do and have two people, one puts on gloves, one doesn't he? Does it matter? <laughs> There's still going to be a do. It doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, they are tied to that Westminster creed of greed. We are going to break from it, and that will show the English working class that there is an alternative. But in an independent Scotland, brothers and sisters, as someone who comes from Irish and Italian stock, as someone who believes in the William McIlvanny saying that Scotland is a mongrel nation, we don't have any pure race in Scotland. We've been made up from the Irish and the Italians and the Poles and the Chileans. We've been made up from the Asians. We've been made up from people who have came to Scotland to live and work and raise their families in an independent Scotland, brothers and sisters. I don't want to build new borders. I want to knock down existing borders. That's what I want to do in an independent Scotland. We ain't going to be a chauvinist country. We are going to be a country that offers the hand of friendship, not the fist of fury to anybody that wants to come and live and work here within our borders. So please, brother, don't allow that to stop you voting for independence because I'll tell you what, staying with the UK is a green light for those reactionary chauvinists. The ones in the Tory party and the ones in the UKIP. They are the ones, and by the way, it's not a working class's fault. They've been abandoned down there. Disillusionment is the biggest problem down there. People don't want to vote for Labour because why? Because they're just the same as the Tories. That's the reality. Here in Scotland we can do things different and we can offer some inspiration to our English brothers and sisters. In relation to the whole idea of the election in 2015, would there be a change if we vote independence on 18th of September? Would the Tories, if they win, try and renege? Well, legally they wouldn't be entitled to because it's been passed by the Houses of Parliament. This bill is legally binding. So if we vote yes, we're going to get independence. That's a reality. You vote no, the Scottish Parliament isn't illegally binding. The Scottish Parliament is a creation of Westminster. It can be uncreated by Westminster. UKIP's already been on record. If they've got any role at all in a coalition government, they are going to move for the abolition of the Scottish Parliament. That's the reality. So, if you want to 
have any say in your future, then voting yes is the only alternative you have. And remember, 2016, we will have the Scottish elections. That's when you can decide what political manifesto you want to support, what political party you want to support. Politics in 2016 in independent Scotland will be very bright and very vibrant. There'll be lots of colour, there'll be lots of ideas, there'll be lots of energy. You can pick what you want from a very, very tasty menu. That's the reality. It won't be grey politics with grey men. It will be very interesting, it'll be very dynamic. It's only if we get independence that will actually mean anything. In relation to the question of oil and gas, there are already geological studies for the West Coast that show clearly that there is as much, if not more, oil and gas available in the West Coast of Scotland than there is in the North Coast of Scotland. And what they're saying is, off Shetland, across the west coast, that it could amount to as much as 4.2 trillion pounds worth of oil and gas. 4.2 trillion. Talk about being a rich nation. All the Standard and Poor, Financial Times, The Economist, they've all done these economic analysis and they say, without oil and gas, Scotland would be a top 20 country. As high as 16, because of its food and beverage and tourists revenue. With oil and gas, it's a top five nation in the world. By the way, with that new set of oil and gas, we'll be in the top one. That's the reality. That's the reality. And by the way, let's think about this. Why is that oil and gas not been extracted in the West Coast? Because it's in the direct shipping line of Trident. Get rid of Trident, then we can extract the oil and gas from the system. Two, two final questions. The brother there raised the point about worrying about ballot box tampering. And by the way, it might sound a bit fanciful, but we are looking here at one of the oldest imperialist nations on the planet that could disintegrate before our eyes. We are talking about ripping up the British establishment. If you think we are not up to dirty tricks, then you have no woken up yet. Any of you, any of you who have got doubts about the possibility of that type of thing happening, go away and purchase The Enemy Within by Seamus Millen, the Guardian journalist, and read what the British establishment did during the miners' strike. How they infiltrated the National Union of Mine Workers, how they planted MI5 operatives at the highest level within that union to destabilise the union and destabilise the strike all documented, all fact, that's what the British state is up to. We have to, like hawks, make sure we're monitoring the ballot boxes and the polling booths on the 18th of September to make sure they don't get away with any of that naughty business. We're going to have to be the eyes and ears and make sure it's a fair vote. Don't rule out that they'll try and do any bad campaign. Brothers and sisters, the final wee point Brother raised the point about democracy, you know. Isn't it wonderful? And sometimes I do get worried about this because we are up against the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> that superheroes for the House of Lords that have been dispatched. Lord Reed, Lord Folks, Lord McConnell, they've all come out. Lord Robertson, we bomber Robertson. <laughs> they've come out. These super lords and their airline capes. <laughs> and they want to frighten us to stay with the UK. Of course, the only way to frighten us is to show us our faces. That frightens us. <laughs> that frightens us enough all. The truth is, brothers and sisters, these lords, they don't care about the new people in the borders. They don't care about low pay. They don't care about unemployment, poverty, inequality. Why would they care? They don't suffer from it. The only thing they care about is on the 19th of September, the reason they're fighting so hard for you to vote no is because on the 19th of September when we vote yes, they're getting a P45 because <laughs> we don't need a house of love anymore. That's the reality. That's the reality. We're going to 
me finish, brothers and sisters, there is a reminder here to register to vote. You have to register by the 2nd of September. Please bear that in mind, everybody. You have to register to vote by the 2nd of September. Please make sure that you do that. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you've enjoyed tonight's meeting. I hope it's given you some information. I hope that you're leaving the hall more informed than when you come in tonight. I hope that you're going to be an ambassador for the Yes campaign. There is only one thing now that prevents us from claiming our freedom, and that's fear. Fear, brothers and sisters. Nelson Mandela once said, may your life's choices be guided by hope, not by fear. We're big enough, we're smart enough, we're certainly rich enough. Brothers and sisters, see the 18th of September. Let's show the world what brave enough as well. Thanks very much. so you can go, go from here tonight and convince one more person, one person in your family, one person in your workplace, one of your mates, one of your football uh, friends, just convince one person. Get involved in the campaign, there's, as you go out in the yes table there, there's a, a sheet that you can fill in and give us your name and address and we'll, we'll get in touch with you. Buy a copy of Tommy's speech, it's only one pound. And to eat in the bucket as you go out, because we've got to pay for the high in the hall, pay for the posters, pay for the car stickers. And take away as much as you want, car stickers, window posters, get them up and show people that you're for a yes. And the final thing is, Jim Sellers, who Tommy has spoken with a few times, I think, during this campaign, said that on the 18th of September, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., sovereignty lies with the people of Scotland for the first time in 300 years. Don't let's let that slip through our fingers, brothers and sisters. Vote yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you.